excited to, to be back uh, in the full swing of things with our, with our Odyssey program. And I am particularly thrilled to be starting off tonight with Frank Cherubino. How many people have known or have read Frank's columns? Lots of enthusiasm, which is great. Um, I, we first became acquainted with him uh, right after we bought here, and we, of course, were avid, Kathy and I are avid newspaper readers, so, of course, we subscribed to the Palm Beach Post. And I always enjoyed his columns, and then I found out that he was teaching down at FAU as part of the Lifelong Learning Center. So I've attended several sessions of his classes, and really uh, just a wonderful experience, and I really got to, to appreciate his perspective, mostly his humor, which, is, which has always, always been good. Um, and it's a kind of a, an interesting and wonderful confluence of events that's brought us here tonight. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Frank first. He uh, grew up in Long Island, which I know many in this room have. Um, he attended the Naval Academy and uh, graduated in 1977 and then served five years uh, on active duty with the Navy. And what he found out, and I found this interesting story that had been written about him, is what he found out in the Navy is that when you're out at sea, how many people were Navy folks here? When you're out at sea, it gets pretty boring. So, um, but he developed not only an interest in reading, but an interest in writing. And he ended up being the public affairs officer for the ships that he was on and got to do a whole bunch of really interesting uh, things during the course of his five years with the Navy. Then he got off active duty and decided this writing thing was pretty good. And I can let Frank ta actually talk about it more, but, I, but his bio on, the, on this is, is really quite interesting. That, so he went to um, um, Northwestern to the um, journalism school out there, got his master's in journalism, went to work for um, a, a local uh, service in Chicago, and then went to, down to the Miami Herald. Uh, where he started his journalistic career down in, um, uh, down in Miami. And in 1989, he came to the Washington, uh, to Washington Post, to the Palm Beach Post, and has, has been there ever since. Um, but that's not all. One of the other things that, um, and that why tonight is such an interesting confluence of events is how many people got the email today about the new our new racquetball program, which has started on December 15th. Pickleball, and how many people signed up for it? Quite a few. Well, what, in class last week, Frank happened to share that he has become a pickleball addict. He and Joe, his wife. So much so that he has just published a book called I Dink, Therefore I Am. <laughs> it must be an inside, pink, inside pickleball joke. Um, but so at any rate, so that's kind of an interesting confluence. On the day that we announce our program, he is here as a pickleball addict and the author of a book, and his books, by the way, will be for sale afterwards if you're interested in, in purchasing them. And, but wait, there's more. In addition to, be, to being a Palm Beach Post columnist, in addition to, be a pickle, to being a pickleball addict, he's also an accomplished musician. He's an accordion player and he plays what he describes as cafe-style accordion music with a big repertoire of French, Italian, and great American songbook favorites. He also plays standards and Sinatra and other jazz favorites on a tenor saxophone. So, and he, he describes his music as adding a touch of atmosphere and elegance to your event. And I think that all of this combined allows him to add a touch of elegance and humor to our event tonight. Please join me in welcoming Frank Cherubino. That was the most comprehensive introduction I think I have ever received. That was wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Paul. It's good to be here. It's good to be anywhere, really, after this COVID-19 thing. I've, uh, I've I haven't spoken to many people while wearing pants in the last two years, so <laughs> I'm fully dressed. It's, um, uh, so my topic tonight is finding humor in the news, which is uh, kind of good if you live in Florida because we're a funny place, right? So if I'm going to get you started. I'll tell you why it's easy to write humor in the news. How many people here were born in Florida? Raise your hand. 
One, one out of all of you were born in Florida. See, this is, this is why it's easy to find humor because nobody's from here. We don't care about where we live. We're, we all live someplace else and we ended up here because we're refugees. We're refugees from something. Bad weather, Central American dictators, high taxes, ungrateful children. For some reason, we end up in Florida and we're not fully invested in being here, but it's sort of like what happens to you. It's kind of like your duty. Well, I guess we go to Florida. I think of it as um, I used to play Chinese checkers when I was a kid. So, you know, Chinese checkers, you know, you have that metal board with the little pock marks and you put your little marbles in there and move them around. Well, the Chinese checkerboard that is the map of the United States is not flat. It's tilted because it's too cold and wet in the northwest. They've got mudslides in the southwest. You've got high taxes, bad weather in the northeast. So it's tilted a little bit down here. So if you're a loose marble, you roll to Florida. <laughs> And that's the best way to think of Florida. It's a collection of America's loose marbles. All the people who couldn't stay in that hole where they were first placed. You know, the marble is jiggling and it's, uh, it's got to go someplace. Where does it go? Florida. And here we are, trying to make the best of it. Usually came down here on our sales pitch that was way overhyped. They called it paradise because it was in February, but by the time it's July, it's, it's something that was mentioned in Dante's Inferno. <laughs> the best definition I heard of summer in South Florida, it's like living inside of somebody's mouth. <laughs> something smells bad, but you can't really figure out where it's coming from, but it's really bad. But we like it here, right? We like it. Like this whole, the whole reason why we, why we have so much crazy things that go on in Florida is because we think of, well, anybody we really care about is 1,500 miles away, so we can do what we want. We can wear Crocs out to a nice restaurant because it's Florida. You wouldn't wear Crocs out to a nice restaurant in some place where you go in the Northeast, but down here, you can wear Crocs and cargo pants to practically any place you want to go, and I'm talking about the women. Um, <laughs> no, there's no rules here. Um, you know, I'll give you a great example. So there was a very, uh, got a lot of ink a couple years ago, a case about a, uh, an Asian massage parlor that got uh, raided in Jupiter. So now, I don't know, you know, you see these places all over the place. This was next to a Publix. So you figure if some place is next to a Publix, it must be okay. You know, there's a CVS sometimes, and sometimes there's an Asian massage parlor. You know, you just don't know. It's a strip shopping center. And so people went in there, and it turned out it wasn't just like a massage on your back. It was what they call a happy ending massage. And, you know, I'm not going to get into the details, but basically a lot of men in golf carts started driving to this place. And, uh, and, uh, and one of them happened to be Robert Kraft, who owns the New England Patriots. And I don't blame him. I mean, he was pulled up in a Bentley with a driver, said, I'll be out in a few minutes. And he went in there and, and got a massage. And... Uh, how was he to know it was illegal? This is Florida. Like I said, people going in, they busted guys that were 84 years old. What 84-year-old guy is looking to do something illegal? Kraft was only 77 because I'm with my people. This is, how, this is what we do. This is how you spend a Florida vacation. You go, not only that, the place had an early bird special. <laughs> it's true. It had a thing, if you got in before one, you got a discount. So guys would go for like early bird tee off times on the golf course. They'd drive the cart over, get an early bird rub and tug, and then they'd go out for dinner and get an early bird dinner. They could have three early birds in a day. That's not illegal, that's Florida living. <laughs> of course they ended up dropping the case. It was just like, well, it was entrapment. Yeah, it was entrapment, you know, the police, they, they were looking for something to do and they found a lot of guys. And, uh, whatever I don't know, it, it, but it's but it's Florida stuff, you know. No, nothing. Nobody really operates on the level here. We had a governor two governors ago, Charlie Crist, who did not own property in Florida. Imagine a governor who is still a renter. That kind of shows you how temporary everything is here. Yeah, I'm the governor of the state, but I don't know if I want to buy something there. No, I, I might have to go to Washington or someplace. 
If anybody, how many people here are just snowbirds? You here for the, oh boy, they're hesitant to raise your hand. No, that's all right, I'm not, I'm not gonna bite your head off. It's, it's fine being a snowbird, but, but if you're not a snowbird, uh, those of you here year round will know that um, we talk too much about the weather during the summer uh, when it doesn't change. So for example, if you're watching a local TV station and there's only 22 minutes in a half hour newscast, they will do seven minutes on the weather in July when the weather is the same every day, right? It's hot and humid, highs near 90, chance of afternoon thunderstorms. That's the weather every day between Memorial Day and Halloween, unless there's a hurricane. Hot and humid, highs near 90, chance of afternoon thunderstorms. And yet, they'll say, John, let's go to John in the Weather Center. Yeah, well, we got this zephyr that's coming in across the Midwest, and it's uh, bringing these, this trough of dry air that's coming through the Plain States, and it's meeting this other front that's coming here, and it's going to be hot and humid, highs near 90, chance of afternoon thunderstorms. And you think, OK, I know, I know. Let's get on with the rest of the weather, or the rest of the news. But they're not done. They're only like kind of winding you know, into the next phase, which is, let's go to the five-day forecast. And they have a board. <laughs> they have a board behind the guy. And they have five days, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And, and there's a thing called, like, I think it's called a Chiron. I don't know. But it's a little, it's a little graphic device that has, um, it's supposed to symbolize hot and humid highs near 90 chance of afternoon thunderstorms. It's the top half of a yellow sun. It's cut off in the middle, and there's a gray cloud kind of stuck to the bottom of the sun half, and then there's a yellow lightning bolt that comes out of the gray cloud. One, and each of those five days will have that, the, the sun, the cloud, the lightning bolt, all five days, and then it'll have highs. It'll say 90, 90. Wednesday might be 91, and then it'll be 90, 90. And I guess you're supposed to watch this and say, ooh, it's going to be hot Wednesday. That would be the day to go to the pool. You know, I don't know what you're supposed to learn from this, but... But they do this, they do it all the time. And uh, nobody's ever tried, I've written about it, I've said, why don't you just, why don't you just like suspend the weather and just say, we'll tell you if a storm's coming, otherwise, you know, it's gonna be hot. You know, there's not gonna be frost on the 4th of July, you know. Uh, but they, they don't care, they kinda do it. So where do I get humor and, and, you know, and find humor? I get it just from reading the newspaper. The newspaper's full of humor, you know, not, unintentional, which is the best kind of humor. So, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm reading one day, there's this little item inside the local news section, and uh, one of the county commissioners in Palm Beach County got the idea that, uh, that strippers needed to carry photo ID cards. This is a real story, that strippers, now think about it, let this sink in, that a stripper needed to carry a photo ID while on the job. <laughs> now, I don't know I don't know much about stripping, but I know that there's no pockets involved. I've never seen a, I've never seen a stripper with a pocket. So where are you supposed to carry the ID while you're working? And they never explained this. Nobody ever thought about this. So I'm thinking like, well, this is this should be a column, because the other thing they said was, they they said the governmental office where would-be strippers would have to go to get their photo ID, and it was the same place where they recounted the ballots for the 2000 presidential election, which <laughs> I thought kind of made sense. So I said, I should get a stripper license for myself because it's government issued photo ID. It's got the seal, it's got the little hologram, it's perfect, you know, you need photo ID. Government issued photo ID is terrific, you know. And uh, so I thought, well, this is great. I ought, to, I ought to show up, so I clipped out the article. And I was a little bit hesitant because um, the only uh, license I had was my driver license, which required both a written and a performance test. And I figured I could pass a written stripper's test. <laughs> because most, you know this, most government tests are multiple choice. There's four possible answers. Two are ridiculous. You can kind of bluster your way to get at least a 70 or an 80 percent on almost any government test. But I was worried about the performance test, that I'd walk in, <laughs> And there'd be a brass pole, and they'd say, OK, Mr. Cherubino, you know, I want you to do whatever the stripping equivalent is to a three-point turn. And I would say, I have no idea what you're talking about. And they'd say, you're not really a stripper. Get out of here. But it turned out I had nothing to worry about, because this was just a shakedown uh, for a whole new bunch of people. That, because the first question I was asked when I walked into the office to get the license was, do you have $25? 
which is a great question uh, because it tells you right away you're going to be successful. So I said, yes, I do. And so I sat down, and they had the photo, they had the camera set up with the screen so you can get your picture taken and they could laminate. It was a one-stop shopping thing. And, um, but before they would do it, they made me fill out a form uh, because they said it would have to be entered in the county database as a stripper. So I said, well, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. You know? so, so I was filling out the form. Uh, I had to give my social security number, my address, and everything. But I, at this point, I'm, I'm just thinking about that card you know, I want to get in. So I get down in the line that says stage name. <laughs> and see, I hadn't planned this out. Because I wasn't thinking, but people that do this for a living don't dance under their real names. They have a fake name. And so I had no idea what sort of stage name I should have. So I, um, I was stalling for time. So I told the clerk, I said, um, you know what? I would hate to duplicate a name that's already taken. Can you do me a favor? And is there any way I can see what stripper stage names have already been taken so I don't do it. And she said, no problem. So she pulled out. There were about 900 other strippers who were already registered. She puts this big thing of paper down. I'm going through looking at the stage names. And I learned that day, something I hadn't previously known, that people who do this pick a name that has something to do with a meteorological condition. More often than not, ice, stormy, you know, moist. Well, not moist, but ice and stormy. <laughs> Forget moist. That was a... It was a wild swing. But, but the only one that would apply to me was mostly cloudy, which, which is not very sexy. So I had to be, I had to think, and I had to think fast. And then I got inspired, because I had been in that same room when they were doing the ballots in 2000. I was reporting on that. And I couldn't believe it. I had read through them again. And the name Dangling Chad was available, which... <laughs> <clears throat> You would think, you would think, if you, there were 37 days of recounts in November and December of 2000, where the big story was the dangling chads of Palm Beach County. There were these little pieces of cardboard that were hanging on the punch cards. They hadn't been punched totally out. They were little perforated squares, and maybe if you put the stylus through and didn't go all the way through, that little chad didn't pop out it just dangled so when they went to read look at the ballots and visually inspect them they found all these dangling chads so all as you heard for 37 days was dangling chads they found more dangling chads now if you're a stripper and you're sitting there watching it you're saying i need to be the dangling chad of palm beach county i need to get this name and reserve it and it was still available i couldn't believe it and even if that one was taken i could have gone with hanging chad which was also available but I, want, I went with something that I could tell my mother about because I knew I was going to send my mother the card and, and, uh, and because my mother at the time thought I, I still had a chance to be president of the United States. And this, this would end any of that. So, um, I, uh, you know, because like, I, you know, I got adult children now. You know, the way it is, you know, sons don't tell you anything. They're pretty, you know, close now. How's things? Okay. All right. And, how, and girls tell you everything way, way much more than you need to know. And so I was kind of like that with my mom. Now that I look back on you, my mom, how's everything? Good, hey, everybody good? Yeah, good, okay, good, good, yeah, we're good, you're good, I'm good, work? Oh, it's good, yeah, okay, talk to you next week, you know. So I thought, it would be, I gotta break that cycle, and I would say, oh wait, yeah, there is something new, I became a stripper. And she would say, no, you didn't, I'd say, yes, I do, and I'm sending you a copy of my stripper card. And then I would send her a copy of the stripper card, which would have my stripper name on it and my picture, topless, which I insisted on not wearing a shirt for my photo. So, so I wanted to pick a name I could send to her. So I picked the name. It's kind of true now. I mean, I'm 66 years old. Rusty Libido is the name I picked for my stripper name. And uh, <clears throat> it was available. And um, I used it uh, briefly. Of course, the uh, American Civil Liberties Union got, you know, they got a way in and they said it was unconstitutional to ask strippers to register to to get IDs, and they canceled the program. But it was good while it lasted. The favorite time I used the card was uh, I was asked to speak to the Hadassah at, at this uh, community called Wycliffe. There was a Jewish women's group. And I went up to the, you know, to the entrance, uh, the visitor's entrance to one of these places, and, and I'm lined up, and they said, uh, yes, sir. And I said, the Hadassah's expecting me. 
And they said, we'll need to see some ID. And I said, sure. So I, I, I gave them the stripper card. So that was worth the $25, just that alone. <clears throat> um, other things that worry about me, that I worry about a little bit in, uh, in South Florida is the fact that um, uh, my wife and I is here tonight. We, we came way too early. We came when we were in our 30s. And we had our children down here. And so now our children have grown up. And they're looking at us like, where are we going to send these people? I mean, we're, you know, we are out of real estate in the United States. You know, it used to be that you'd have the kids up in the Northeast and they would know, okay, we've got to send mom and dad to Florida. Okay, we've just got to go. First we'll visit and then we'll, you know. But now we're already here. Where are they going to send us? And I, I got a little bit of a scare when I learned that NASA had started doing experiments on senior citizens living in outer space. I swear, they were doing, they, we were doing experiments to see how the aging human body would react to space travel. I'll tell you what, lousy, that's how it would react. Most, most older people I know don't even like to drive on I-95 anymore. Never mind going on a spaceship. Are you kidding me? Why do I want to go on a spaceship? No, I'll take the back road. No, I, I, you know, so, but it's like, I don't know if you remember, they sent poor John Glenn, you know, American hero, astronaut in the Apollo program. They sent him back, after he was senator in Ohio, they sent him back up on a space shuttle. They said, he doesn't have to do anything, he just has to sleep. And we're going to monitor his, his vitals. It's like, you want to monitor an old guy sleeping? I bet you can come here tomorrow at 3 in the afternoon, and there'll be three or four guys asleep out in the lobby <laughs> by that Christmas tree. Yeah, you don't need to send a guy now to space. So I'm, I'm worried. I can, only, I can only imagine it's coming, you know, in a, one of these days. My, and they're talking about going to the moon again and everything. I can see my kids saying, like, uh, Dad, it's just going to be for the season. That's how they would start. It'll just be for the season. You can go up there and it won't be bad at all. Um, the other thing about writing a column that is, uh, that is uh, uh, funny or, or at least there's a, a chance for humor is that... Uh, People think you, I can solve their problems, uh, including circulation problems. Uh, if you get, now I'm not talking about body circulation, I'm talking about circulation of newspapers. So, so for example, if somebody gets a wet newspaper, you could call the circulation uh, department in a paper, but you can also call me. And I don't know why, but they just see, I, oh, there's a guy, he's got a picture, I bet you he can solve every problem I have. So they call up and said, I got a wet paper, or I didn't get a paper. Or I got the Sun Sentinel crossword puzzle. Or I got this, I got that. Every day I get all these, these questions about circulation. And it's like because you have your, because you're a columnist, you have your photo in there, and, you're, and they say, well, this, this person must know something. And I don't. And, uh, and so I get letters from all sorts of people, um, including people who are in the Palm Beach County Jail. Um, I get a lot of mail from people who are in the jail. Uh, and it's, I learned at one point that um, we were, we were uh, passing out the newspaper in the jail, because I don't know if you know this, we're looking for subscribers anywhere we can get them. And, uh, and they were giving out the paper, and people would read the paper, and the jail had a policy that if you wanted to write a letter, if you're an inmate, they would supply you with the stationery and the, and the, you know, the, the, the blank page. So these um, inmates would write me uh, sometimes they'd comment about what I was writing about, but often they would comment about some problem that they th wanted to be addressed or some, something that had nothing to do with themselves. Sometimes it was just something they read in the paper that, that rubbed them the wrong way. And they would get these letters from jail. Now, I, I would know they're coming from the jail before I even opened them because there would be a white business size envelope and on the back was a stamp. And in black ink it said, this mail originates from an inmate in the Palm Beach County Jail. So you know it was coming from an inmate. And um, I don't know why they had to tell you that, but I, I maybe want somebody else to open it in case something jumps out. I don't know. But anyway, so I would get these letters, and I'd open them up, and it was the usual complaints. And then one day, I got a letter, the same business size envelope, but it was thick. And it had the stamp on the back, and I opened it, and it was multiple pages. It was a petition signed by many of the inmates. And it was a complaint about their food, and they decided to come to me to ask me to alleviate the horrible food that they were eating. I think their main complaint was that it was overcooked and under seasoned. And they had a plan that I would come and just without announcing, I would eat dinner at the jail one night and then I would write how awful the food was and put it in a column 
and then the American Civil Liberties Union lawyer in town would read that and file a lawsuit, and they'd fire the caterer and get somebody new to cook for them. That was the plan. And I was in for that plan. I liked the idea of going to the jail to eat, uh, because uh, why not? I'm always looking for columns. And my wife's here. I'm not going to say anything too bad about her cooking or anything, but the jail was going to be a nice break. So. <clears throat> Imagine what I say when she's not here. That's what I'm, no, I'm only, we're, we've managed to get through 41 years, so if she kills me tonight, you know why. <laughs> so anyway, so I thought, well, yeah, I should go. It was a, I remember it was a Tuesday night. So um, <clears throat> during that day, in the morning on that Tuesday, I called up the jail administration and I asked if there was any way I could get in. They usually don't get people who are trying to get in. It's usually the other way. So it's like, oh, we got somebody who wants to get in. You know, well, what do you want to get in for? I said, I want to eat dinner. And I explained to them that I was, you know, a columnist of the paper, and, uh, and inmates had written me about the food, and I wanted to experience it firsthand. And they said, uh, no problem. Um, you know, show up at like 4.30. They eat very early. By the way, this might be a good field trip for you if you, instead of going to like the usual things, you know, get a couple of buses, go out to the Martin County Jail, have dinner. It's a great experience. And at 4.30 might not even be too early for some people here. You know, just go, have the dinner, see the, hear the doors close behind you. It's a great feeling when you leave. You know, it's really a wonderful feeling when you leave. But, but uh, so I did, I went there, I went into the jail. I had, I uh, ate off the metal tray. Um, and uh, I remember they had chicken and rice, pineapple upside down kick. It was, uh, it was pretty good. It wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, it was better than Applebee's, but you know, between Applebee's and Houston's maybe, you know. So, so I, um, I went back and I wrote a column that, uh, and I explained, I said, I got this thing in the mail. It was just uh, clearly, you know, I went with an open mind to see what it was about. And I was just pleasantly surprised how, how good the food was. And boy, the mail I got after I wrote that column. Oh, man. So the people were like, I, then I get these letters from the inmates. How much did they pay you to write that column? Because I don't know, it must have circulated around. Or they put it like on a cork board and they said, oh, by the way, we got four stars from the Palm Beach Post. You're going to like it here, you know. I don't know what it was. But anyway, but they, for months, I got inmates complaining, oh, you had the chicken and rice now, you should come when they have the Salisbury steak or, you know, or all that stuff. <clears throat> Until finally I get a letter, once again, thick envelope, has the stamp on the back, this mail originates in the Palm Beach County Jail. And I open it up, and it's just a single piece of paper, but there's a breaded veal cutlet with one bite taken out of it. <laughs> and it falls on the floor, it's just breaded veal cutlet laying there. And, um, and I read on the paper, and all it says is, you try eating this, you SOB. That's all it has in there. So it was my favorite piece of mail. I, occasionally, I misjudge columns. You know, I think something's going to be funny or useful or interesting. And then I hear that it's not you know, by a lot of people. Uh, the column that I probably wrote that was probably the most hated in my 30 years of writing a column for the Post was one I thought was really going to be well received. Um, it's, uh, it happened, it was a true story. One night, um, my wife and I are um, in bed as a, like a Saturday night, Sunday morning, like three in the morning kind of thing. And we hear the sound coming from our bathroom. And my wife thinks our daughter is throwing up. And so she goes in, I'm still asleep in the bed. She goes in and she comes running out and she starts nudging me like urgently and says, there's a rat trying to climb out of our toilet bowl. Now, this is 3 in the morning on a weekend, and I'm a very optimistic sort of person at this time. So I say, are you sure? Because I want to give her a chance to say no so I can go back to sleep. And she's very frantic, and she she's, wants immediate action, uh, or either that or just to call a realtor and sell the house within an hour. So <clears throat> I said, OK. <clears throat> so I go in, walk in the bathroom. Sure enough, there's this rat doing this chin up on the, on, the, on the seat, sees me, jumps down between my legs into the bedroom, soaking wet, somewhere in the bedroom. Now, the other thing is we had an infant child at the time, so we didn't flush after 6 o'clock at night. So this rat was not coming out clear water. It was coming. So it's urine-soaked rat 
in the bedroom someplace. Now, the lucky part, we have a dog. A dog that was bred to kill badgers. A dachshund. You know those dogs with those big snoots that go into holes and they pull up? I think, finally, after all the useless years of this animal's life, laying between us in bed, just being a love sponge that's so annoying, it, it, this will finally, the dog will meet its destiny as a hunter of critters. And so we wake up Ruby and put her down on the floor and say, Ruby, get the rat. And Ruby immediately susses out the situation and knows that there's a badass animal in this room much more, much worse than she, and she runs out of the bedroom. She doesn't want any part of the rat. So now I close the door. My wife is standing on the bed, reiterating her, her plea to move. And, uh, <clears throat> and, I, and, and she says, we have to get the rat. So I go to the garage to get a weapon. Now, I came from, as, as uh, you know, as, as Andy said, I came from Long Island. And we in Long Island, the only thing we kill are, is our appetites, right? So we don't have a, it's not like we come from a hunting tradition where, I, I, you know, my father worked for Entenmann's. We just killed off the cake. <laughs> <laughs> so I go to the garage to look for a suitable weapon to kill this rat. And I come back with a whisk broom, <laughs> which my wife says, are you just going to annoy it to death? <laughs> And it was like, it was the best thing I have. And it reaches on there. So I'm, I'm poking, you know, with the broom. And I flush the rat out. And I'm going to spare you the details. But it took, it took a while. And, and it was just like, oh, I was sweating. I had, a, I had to watch C-SPAN just to go to bed that night. And, and I was like, I get the rat. So the next morning, it's like, we have to deal with this situation. So I call a, um, an animal trapper. They have these animal trappers down here. And... Uh, I uh, it, love it when an animal trapper comes to your house. It lets the whole neighbors know that you're infested. And it just says, like, rodent control, you know? It's just like giant letters. It's like, oh, if there's only some way you could park. In the car. So the guy, guy says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to save you some money. I'm not even going to come out. He said, um, he said, do yourself a favor. He says, do you have palm trees with fronds that overhang your roof? I said, yeah, actually, in the back, there's a palm tree, and there's a flat roof, a flat deck, and there's a couple of fronds that, that, fronds that, that drape over. And he says, well, the rats are in the trees. They come out. They walk out on the palm fronds. If they can get on your roof at night, they're looking for something to eat. They're on your roof. They find that each of your toilets has a, down, has a spout, like a, a pipe. And it's remember like when you, when you used to have to, when you, when you had beer and soda, you used to have to make two holes in the top of the can so that it would pour out? That's because it, has, a, it needs to be a column of air. It like pushes the hydraulic, you know, it's like sort of like you need that column of air to push the liquid out. The toilet works on the same thing. It's a gravity flush, and you need to have a, an air pipe. So that each of your toilets has a big pipe that goes all the way up from the toilet to the roof. And that's what makes the air flush. So when you flush, the water goes down, goes into your sewer, you never see it again. Well, if the rat is up on the roof and they inspect this pipe, the pipes are supposed to have a, um, a, a little uh, metal uh, grid, like a little, like a little covering that is, uh, that is uh, on them that allows uh, the air to get through but nothing to go in. But we had just had Hurricane Wilma that year, and he said a lot of the, of, the, of the coverings on the pipes on the roof got blown away with the storm, and I'll bet you that you don't have any coverings on your, the pipes for your toilet. So you need to go up on your roof and see that. If you don't have the covering and you have the palm front, you trim the palm front, you go to Home Depot, you spend about $2, and you buy you know, things to cover your other things, and your problem is solved. So sure enough, I go there. So, so what happens with the rat? crawls up, falls down the pipe, and when it goes, it goes all the way down, and there's like a U thing, and it goes, if it goes one way, it goes out to the sewer, you never see it, but if it goes the other way, it comes up your toilet, so that's what he said probably happened. So I go to the roof, sure enough, pipes uncovered, go to Home Depot, <clears throat> get it solved. Now I'm thinking, I ought to write about this for a column. This is like news people can use. Everybody experienced Hurricane Wilma, so I wrote about this experience. I got more angry <clears throat> calls, emails, everything from that. And I learned something that, that from that that I didn't know, uh, as a woman explained to me, do you know where I am when I read your column? And, and it turns out, <clears throat> <laughs> 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 
it turns out that an awful lot of people read my column on the toilet bowl, <laughs> which I did not know. But it kind of makes sense. And so the, the complaint was that I should have had a disclaimer on the top of the column that said, if you are sitting on your toilet bowl, stop reading this right now. Get up off the bowl. Do not read any further. It's a very hated column. Um, every once in a while, because you write a column, you get to be a little bit of a celebrity, like a little bit of a celebrity. Um, and, and I mean little. So I, I, was, uh, I mentioned the, the election of, of, um, of November 2000, which was really centered, the recount was really centered down in Palm Beach County because it was a nicer place than Jacksonville. So really, you could have done the recount in Jacksonville. There were about 40,000 ballots there that were kind of spoiled. You could have made a whole thing about the Jacksonville supervisor election and the one in, in, uh, in that county. Uh, uh, really cost the, the uh, election, but it would, made much more sense to go down to Palm Beach County because our hotels are much better, and, uh, and you could stay in Palm Beach, and you could have a much better time. So, so we became the focal point for the, for the election, and, um, and so reporters are all hanging out there, and they're all looking for something to do. Uh, I remember Greta Van Susteren, who was with CNN back then, this is before she went to Fox, uh, her husband and, and she were, were, were sailors, and they had a sailboat, and they just took the sailboat down, and they docked it in the marina at West Palm Beach, and they were living on their sailboat for a month while they covered the election. It was a really fun time for them. Other reporters took surfing lessons, ran up big expense accounts at the Chesterfield Hotel and the Breakers and all that place. So um, <clears throat> they're looking for justified things. So at CNN did a show called Talk Back Live during those years, and uh, it was something they did in the, in the CNN Center in Atlanta, and it was a, it was a a live talk show, it was like an hour long show about some event of the day. And they decided, well, let's do this talk back live show in, uh, in Palm Beach rather than in Atlanta while we're doing the recount. So they moved the whole operation down to West Palm Beach. There was a little, there still is a little Christian school there called Palm Beach Atlantic College. Or maybe it's a university now, but anyway, it's a little school. And um, they, were, they sort of used the gym as their TV studio. They had the, the students as the studio audience sitting in the bleacher, bleachers, and they turned the, the floor of the basketball court into a studio, and they did the show there. And so <clears throat> my editor got a call from one of the bookers on the show and said, for one particular day, they were going to do a show about uh, Palm Beach County. What's the politics like in Palm Beach County? And they wanted a panel of four local people and, and the, the booker said, do you have somebody from your newspaper you can send? So my editor comes out of the office, and I'm just sitting there. And he says, would you like to be on CNN this afternoon? So I said, yes, because I had never been on national TV. And I thought, well, why not? This will be, um, be an experience. So I was about like 11 or 12. I had to get there by 2. The show starts at 3. I had to get like makeup on, all this stuff, all this big TV stuff. So I was like, oh, wow. I, I had a, I'm going to call my mother and tell my mother that I'm going to be on CNN. She'll think, even though I can't be president because I've been a stripper, at least I can get on CNN. That'll impress her. So I call her up, and my mom and my dad, when he was alive too, they, they, um, they both had the, that New Yorker cartoon version of America. You know the cartoon that had New York and then, then just a vast wasteland, and then Los Angeles and San Francisco, and maybe a Chicago Tower in the middle, but just the United States with this vast wasteland. That was their view of America. They pretty much viewed that if you got below, say, exit nine on the New Jersey Turnpike, you were marrying your cousin and eating squirrels. That was like, <laughs> that was their view of the rest of America. So they, they couldn't imagine Anybody, they, their idea is they couldn't imagine anybody moving to Florida. Why would you move to Florida? They don't even have good cheese there. You know, it's like they have great cheese there, Mom. Anyway, so, so, uh, so I call her and I say I'm going to be on CNN, and naturally she says, "Yes, but will that be my CNN?" Because she assumes as part of being in New York, you get a higher level of CNN. <laughs> because people in Florida would be too stupid to understand the New York version of CNN. So I said, I said, Mom, I said, we all get the same CNN. You don't get a higher, you know, octane CNN because you live in Long Island, you know? And so I go off to the thing, 
and I get the makeup on, and then the, and the show runner. So now, now they have the four people that they've called. I meet the other three people who agreed to be on it. And one is Greta Van Susteren. The other one is Alcy Hastings, who just passed away recently. He was a, he was a federal judge who got impeached in a bribery scam, scandal, so he immediately won as a congressman. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great career path. See, mo most people commit the crimes at the end, but if you do it in the beginning, it's even better. So, so he, he was a congressman, a longtime congressman who had been a federal judge. So he's gonna explain what it's like down here. And the other one was Mary McCarty, a Palm Beach County commissioner who would eventually go to prison in Texas for honest services fraud. So this is the four people, you know, and Greta Van Susteren, of course, would go to Fox, which is probably the worst of all three outcomes. But anyway, so <clears throat> I'm there with these three other people. And I'm thinking like, this is like if you go to hell, we're like the greeting committee, you know? Hey, looks like you didn't leave a good life. Welcome, you know? So, um, uh, the, the, the show person says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have uh, Greta and Frank on the first panel, and then we're going to have Alcy and Mary on the second panel. And we'll do, we'll go to commercial. After the first panel, we'll go to commercial. You two come off, then the other two come on, and we'll do it that way. So it's like, okay, great. So get the makeup on. Greta Van Susteren and I go out. We sit down out in this uh, gymnasium. The kids are all ramped up there. Get them all, you know, hyper for this thing. Get to work the crowd. Out comes the, the talk show host, whose name is Bobby Batista. She's no longer on television, but at the time she, she came on and she starts talking to us. And immediately I go into a panic because she has a very odd trait for a talk show host. And there's no charitable way of saying this. She's cross-eyed. So when she asks a question, everybody answers. Every, it's just like, <laughs> you can't take a chance. So this is, my, this is my TV debut, and I have no idea if you're talking to me, you're talking to Greta, you're talking to the sound guy, what are, who are we talking to? Give us a hint. So I'm thinking, this is gonna be terrible. And then they're getting ready to start, and they have the intro music, and they get the lights going, and then right before we go on, poof, the lights go off, and they said, we've been preempted for breaking news. And it's like, oh no, breaking news, and everybody thinks, Oh, maybe Al Gore conceded the election. Maybe, you know, what's going on? And we're kind of like in the dark and, and, and people are listening to find out why we got preempted. And we're sitting there for minutes. And, and finally, we learned that, uh, that right at the time we were going to go on, Al Gore, I believe he had a house in Vienna, Virginia, had, and the TV trucks were camped outside of it. And he decided to do a little, uh, to show how relaxed he was while he was waiting for the vote counting, that he would go out on his front lawn and play catch with a football with one of his kids. So Al Gore steps outside his house, right when I'm gonna make my TV debut, and starts playing, throwing a football with one of his sons. And somebody in Atlanta has to make a decision. Okay, do we put on these two mopes here in Florida, or do we show Al Gore throwing the football? And they say, let's show Al Gore throwing the football. So it got preempted. So there was my TV debut. Take the makeup off, go back to work. Phone rings, my mother. I don't know where you were. We had Al Gore was playing football. <laughs> I didn't see you at all. <clears throat> um, I probably should mention, I, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna tell, well, I'll tell one Trump story. And this is, um, so one of, the, one of the other hazards of being in the uh, you know, local news business in Palm Beach County is that the, the people who live in Palm Beach are just like, off the page. I mean, they're just, they're just a really fun assortment of, of, of people who have way too much time on their hands and more money than they know what to do with. And so they do crazy things. I remember I, the first time I was writing a column, and this is the first year I found out the town of Palm Beach scents their sewer water. Every week, they put a different fragrance in the sewers. And they had four fragrances, lilac, honeysuckle. I mean, their crap literally doesn't stink in Palm Beach. I mean, some people, <laughs> they have taken the extra step to make that true. <laughs> and and uh, so, th so there's all sorts of great things. And, and of course, like the people who cycle through are, are really interesting people. So, so I knew, I mean, Trump, when, when, he, was, when he first moved in to Mar-a-Lago, Mar-a-Lago was, um, was like an albatross for the federal government. You know, Mary, Marjorie Merriweather Post had this giant house with a big yard and all these rooms to, to maintain. And, and, uh, and she died, and in her will, she willed it to the federal government to be used as a presidential retreat. And it sat empty for 10 years. 
No president wanted to use it. They all had their own places. And, uh, and so the federal government was paying like $2 million a year just for upkeep on the place. And they decided, let's sell it. And the first few people who came along, uh, the deals bombed out. Uh, they didn't, uh, they fell through, it was contingent on something else. And then Trump had just done Trump Tower in, in New York in uh, the mid 80s and uh, he was kind of flying high. And he bought the place, uh, put down almost nothing. And, uh, and I think he put 2,200 down, <laughs> seriously. And, uh, but they were so eager to get rid of it. I think he bought the house for seven million and the furnishings for three or something. It was just like a quick sale. And he got the house, but then he found out, just like everybody else, that it was an albatross, that it was all this money that you had to do to keep it up. And not only that, but he was getting divorced with Ivana, and the nine, 1990 took a real, real estate uh, business took a real hit because the market quickly went south, suddenly couldn't sell units anymore. And uh, so he tried to unload it, and he couldn't unload it. The town wouldn't let him, he wanted to subdivide it into mini mansions, and the town wouldn't let him do it, so he sued the town because they wouldn't let him do it. And he sued the county because the planes were flying over and they were dripping gas on the roof. And he said, you should move the flight path so it doesn't go over my roof. And they wouldn't do that, so he sued the county. He was just really kind of like, so he was in the news for, for basically um, you know, house troubles. But then it came that in the terms of his divorce, uh, they, while they were figuring out how to divvy things up, they decided that uh, they would share the house, he and Ivana, and she would have it one month and he would have it the next month and they'd alternate. So it was the first January that he was going to have the house. Uh, he decided that he was gonna throw the biggest party of the season at the house to show that he was getting along very well with his divorce and, um, and scheduled it on the night of the Red Cross Ball, which is the big night in Palm Beach where, the, where the, the, all the A-listers you know, go to the, the Red Cross Ball as like the first, you know, the first order of, of society balls. So he schedules his party that night just to conflict with it to make people go to his thing rather than the Red Cross Ball. Anyway, so he schedules the thing and he has a publicist call up the office. The same editor who sent me to, to do the, you know, the, the, the show, Talk Back Live, says you wanna go to Trump's house He's having a party, supposedly going to be the biggest party of the season. He's going to invite all these people. Uh, you want to do it. So I'm thinking, like, yeah, this would be good because I have a column in Sunday's paper. The party's Saturday night. starts at 8 o'clock. I go to the party for like an hour and a half or so, soak it up, get in my car, drive back to West Palm Beach, write a column, and it'll be in the next day's paper, and I solve my, my problem for what I'm going to write about on Sunday. So I said, yes, I'll go there. So... Saturday night rolls around, and I have, you know, as Andy said, I was in the Navy. One of the things that, that the Navy has imprinted upon me is to always be on time. I'm just, I'm rarely late for anything. I'm usually way too early. And, um, and so I'm the first person that arrives at the party of the century or whatever he called it, you know. And I drive up. Now, at the time, something else you ought to know uh, is that I, you know, a lot of guys are kind of have like this thing about their cars where they like to always be in a new car and it's got to be like a really beautiful new car and they trade it in every two or three years. I am not like that guy. I'm the guy that buys a reliable car and runs it until it's unreliable 10 to 12 years later, 250,000 mile later. So at the time, I was in uh, economic set, I was in the Corolla, uh, you know, area of, of, of ownership. And I had a red Toyota Corolla that was at pretty close to the end of its natural life, where eventually what you do is you get on the phone and you call up National Public Radio and you say, or WLRN, I have a car you can have if you can tow it away. And then you see the oil going down the street. Anyway, so I pull up to the party in the century, the first guest in a red Toyota Corolla with about 200,000 miles on it. Now, the other thing is that I did not have a garage for the Corolla. So if you have a red car in South Florida for 10 years, it is no longer a red car. It is a Pepto-Bismol pink car. So, and I did had the roll-up windows, but it didn't work on the driver's side. So the only way I could, if somebody wanted to talk to me, I couldn't roll down the window. I had to open the door to talk to him. So these were the issues I had as I drove into Mar-a-Lago and I was stopped immediately at the gate by the guard or the, you know, whatever is, you know, whoever is somebody working at the property and they said, excuse me, 
this is a private uh, residence. Uh, this isn't the public road. You need to turn around and go out on that road. And I said, I know it's a private residence. I am here for the party. And he couldn't believe it. And I said, check the list. Frank Cherubino at the Palm Beach Post. So he goes away for a while, and he's you know, on his little thing in his ear. He's coming back. I can see he's disappointed, so I know I'm getting in. So he says, all right, get that car and put it behind those shrubs over there. He says, make sure to get the car and just put it there. I got the door open because I'm talking to him, you know. So <laughs> close it. Go park behind the shrubs. And he says, then stand out on the driveway. So I stand out on the driveway. I'm kind of by the portico, maybe from here to that back of the room to the portico. And I'm waiting. Now the other guests start arriving. <clears throat> they all get let in. I'm standing out on the driveway. Pretty soon, a couple of the other reporters who also got that same call that we could send one person from your news organization to cover the party. So there's a, suddenly there's a reporter from the Sentinel, the shiny sheet, Channel 5, Channel 25, Channel 12, and we're all standing out there on the driveway waiting for the sign to go into the house for the party. And we never get the sign. It's now it's 9 o'clock, and we're out there for like an hour. We can hear the music playing. Uh, certainly, people are full of, the house is full of people. And we're thinking, like, what's the problem here? But we're not, you know, we're not gate crashing. We're waiting, and then Trump comes out. So he walks out, and he's being Mr. Jolly, and he says, "Would anybody like a cup of coffee?" Like we're standing in his driveway, you know, we're supposed to go to the party. You know, it's like, no, we don't want a cup of coffee. We want to go into the party. We're not ready yet. Uh, we're getting things ready. When we get it all ready for you, we'll let you in. Turns around, goes in, and we're thinking like, well, what do we mean getting ready? And it's like, maybe there's some special guests who he wants to arrive, and he wants to make sure that we see them when we go in, or something, whatever. So. We're waiting. Now it's like 9.30, and people are starting to sweat. I'm thinking, like, I got to have a column that's written by, by midnight, and here it is, 9.30, and I'm still in the driveway. You know, I haven't gotten in. Trump comes out again. At this point, it's like, oh, finally, here we go. And we all start walking towards him. And instead of saying, okay, come on, he's going like, back, back, like, like going like this. And then there's a film crew. There's like a TV crew behind him getting this whole scene where we're going like, Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump. And he's going like, back, back back and we're being repelled back onto the driveway by him and then he turns around and goes inside but we recognize the reporter who's with the camera guy that's behind him that's getting the scene and it was a guy named Judd Rose who was a national reporter for ABC News or one of those news magazine shows so we call him over it's like Judd and now we're mad at Judd Rose like how did Judd Rose get why isn't Judd Rose standing out on the on the driveway with the rest of us and like, how did you get in? And he goes, I've been here all weekend. He goes, we're doing a piece on the divorce, and uh, we've been guests of, uh, of, of Trump for the whole weekend. We're staying, we're staying tonight. And it was like, well, why, why isn't he letting us in? And he said that the party is so popular that people who weren't invited are trying to get in. They're gate crashers, and he has to keep them out. So I was thinking like, oh, so we weren't actually invited to go in. We are invited to look like we wanted to go in so he could say, I'm sorry, you can't go in. So I'm thinking, like, this is a much better column for a guy like me than actually going into the party. So I'm like, everybody else is like, oh, that's terrible, and oh, how am I going to get in? I'm like, I'm ready to go. I go find my Corolla behind the shrubs. I drive back, go across the bridge, start writing my column. I call up my editor, and he said, how did, how did things go at Trump's? I said, I don't know. I didn't get inside, but I got a better column, and I explained to him what happens. And so they put the column on the front page of the paper instead of on the local front of the paper. They put it down on the bottom of the front, getting, getting pretend invited to a party. Uh, it's kind of a first. And um, so important part of the story I haven't told you yet is at the time my brother worked for Trump, um, like in a big way. My brother's a big lawyer in New York. And uh, at the time, he was managing Trump's debt, which you might imagine is like a full-time job. So. My brother traveled with him, you know, went to have things with him. The name Cherubino is not like Smith, right? So Trump must have read the Palm Beach Post that morning. The next morning gets up and sees my column, and he calls my brother in Connecticut and says, this is according to my brother, because he calls me up like you know, Sunday morning. He says, Trump just called me. And he, I pick up the phone, and he says, do you have an asshole brother named Frank who lives in Florida? <laughs> my brother says, yes, I do. So, <laughs> So he goes, he was at my place last night. It was a big misunderstanding. He wrote this thing. It was a big misunderstanding. I can't believe he wrote this thing. Big, 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 big misunderstanding. So my brother says, we'll talk to him. He says, I'm going to call him. He says, I'm going to call him tomorrow, and I'm going to work this thing out. You know? and, and my brother said, fine. So, so my brother calls me to say, Trump's really upset, and he's going to call you tomorrow at work. And I was like, fine. You know, that would be great. You know? So sure enough, Monday I'm at, I'm at 
the, the post office, sitting at my desk, the phone rings, I pick it up, and it's like Donald Trump. It's like, hey, Frank, Donald Trump. I said, oh, hey, Mr. Trump, how was the party? You know, and, and he goes, you know, Frank, he says, why did you tell me you're Tom's brother? I said, well, why would I do that? He goes, if you would have told me I would, you were Tom's brother, I would have let you right in. I said, that's not the point. I said, I, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not upset that you didn't let me in. I said, you made the column. I said, as a matter of fact, if you want to invite me to another party and not let me in, let me know. I'd be happy to act like I want to go into one of your parties. It would be wonderful, you know? I've never had this experience before, and I'm learning to like it, you know? We hang up the phone. I got a call from my brother five minutes later. He goes, Trump just called me again. He said, you're a bigger asshole than he thought you were. <laughs> Anyway, it was the beginning of a beautiful relationship. Um, so, uh, so I want to. I'm going to open up for questions, but I just wanted. I want, briefly. I understand from um, Andy that you're getting, you're getting pickleball courts, which uh, is near and dear to my heart. I, I am. Um, I'm not really like an athlete, athlete, but like most people, when the pandemic hit, um, I was bored, you know, and so my wife and I would just go for walks. I'm sure you did the same thing. You just go. Let's go for a walk. It was almost like the law. You had to go put your shoes on, and you traipse around the neighborhood, and then eventually you'd get tired of your neighborhood, and you traipse around another neighborhood. And eventually, we went to this park, which we hadn't been to in forever. It was actually, a new, it was actually across the street from a park. They had just added a new addition. And there were four pickleball courts there. And it was like, well, look at this, pickleball. I've heard about pickleball. I actually did a column on National Pickleball Day once where I went out. And I played briefly. I didn't know where to stand. I could never keep score. It was just like, oh, okay, let, let, me, let me just get out of here. But now we had all this time on our hands. So we went to Amazon and ordered some paddles. And, uh, and we started playing pickleball. And it was a lot of fun. Because pickleball, you got to kind of play with doubles, uh, especially once you get older. The courts, even though the court's small, you play with singles, uh, there's too much running around. You get doubles, it's perfect. Three steps and you're there at the ball. You get a lot of exercise, but not too much exercise. You don't get hurt if you don't go crazy and try to hit a lob by going. Anyway, it's a good game, good exercise, good socialization. You meet people because you have to, because you have to find other couples to play pickleball with. So our cell phones now are full of contacts that just has somebody's first name and the last name is Pickleball. You know, there's like Edward Pickleball and, you know, Isabel Pickleball. And everything. So when I want to, we want to play Pickleball, I just go to the phone and I type in Pickleball and all these names come through and then it's called, are you free tomorrow night from 7 to 8.30? No? Okay. Or I'll try somebody else. You know, and you line up and it's just like, I feel like a mob boss. I'm lining up all these people. We've got a game. How about you? There's one, we got one opening here. Can you fill in somebody there? Anyway, so it's really a lot of fun. So, uh, and just because, it is, which is what I do, I write, I'm sitting around and bored during the, uh, the, the epidemic, during the pandemic. And so I wrote a book about becoming obsessed with pickleball. And I imagine it as a why-to book rather than a how-to book. I don't explain all the rules. There's plenty of books that say, you know, pickleball from A to Z, and I'll explain the, the double bounce rule and all that other stuff. But this is, um, this is just basically my sort of like personal essays on, on how I got uh, hooked on pickleball and some weird things I found out about pickleball. Like, for example, pickleball has a relationship to crime. I don't know if you knew this, but, uh, but some towns have fought crime by building pickleball courts. So I talked to this guy who was the uh, city manager of Orem, Utah, and he said they used to have a park where there was drug dealing going on, and it was right by an elementary school. So they just put pickleball courts where people were dealing drugs. And he said either the drug dealers started playing pickleball or they moved someplace else because there's no drug dealing in the park anymore because people play pickleball from 6 in the morning to 10 at night. The courts are always full. There's no place to conduct an illegal business because there's always somebody there saying, like, who wants to play pickleball? I got to, you know, it's like, so uh, anyway, so it's a wonderful thing. And I, and I really hope you all give it a try. And, uh, and, and uh, I think it's really worth it. And if you would like, as Andy said, if you would like, we have copies of the book. Uh, $10, I will, I will autograph them, which is like a great, uh, so it's $10, you're getting off cheap uh, for personal gift that's really inexpensive, which is a perfect thing to do. If you can show somebody you care, but not more than $10 worth, you're, you're a winner. So, all right, so I'll open it up for questions if anybody has anything about, uh, about anything I've spoken about or haven't spoken about. We're doing this Phil Donahue style. You see, we got Andy with the microphone and, and Paul. Okay. No takers. No takers. All right. Well, I'll tell you. Uh, I'll tell you. Should I tell you one more story or no? Yeah. One more. One more. Just one more brief, a brief Trump story. This is a 
uh, over the years, of course, I would continue writing, being a wise guy, and, uh, and he would continue to tell my brother that he was going to sue me, and this was it. And, ah, your brother, that's it. I call the lawyers. Your brother's done for him. You know, of course, he'd never do it. But the one that really set him off, of all the things, which I thought was like, how thin a skin do you have to have? Because I thought this was one of the funniest things around. So he, he had a golf course. He still does. has a golf course in West Palm Beach that he got a very good deal on the land because it was not a very prime piece of land. It was right next to the Palm Beach County Jail, which is a 12-story building that looks like a jail. It's a big building with barbed wire and you know people playing basketball. And, 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 um, and he built a, a big luxury golf course around it and then was dismayed to find out that the golfers were saying, what's that building over there? And he would say, it's the courthouse, but it doesn't look like a courthouse. And so, <laughs> so he eventually got to the point, just like he did with the airport, where he called up the sheriff and he said, is there any way you can move the jail? So at the time, I, was in a, I had a good relationship with that sheriff. So right after Trump asked him to move the jail, the sheriff called me up and said, Frank, I'm going to give you a good column. He said, I just hung up the phone from Trump, and he asked me to move the jail. I said, Bob, I'm on it right away. Don't worry about it. I got you covered. So then I was like, OK, so that's a funny thing. So then what do you say about that? How do you make it you know, into a column with you know, you know, 700 words? So um, I had this idea that I was going to have a contest a rename the jail contest, where I would, um, I said, the object is uh, we want to fool all these people who are coming in from out of town and playing golf. We want to fool them by the sign to make them think the place is a luxury hotel. But we want a name that we locals will know is really the jail. So you have to come up with a name that serves the double purpose of being both uh, a possible hotel and also a possible jail. And, uh, and we got a lot of entries. And my favorites, I couldn't decide. I actually had two winners because I thought these two were, were great. The first one was Bar-a-Lago, which I thought was a great one, too. And the second one was The Breakers Inn. <laughs> now, right, right, it's funny. Now, even if you're the guy with the golf course, you'd think you'd laugh. But his thing was like, no, that's it. I'm suing him. I am suing him. You know, it's like. Anyway, all right. Well, anyway, thanks for being a great audience. I'm going to be in the back if you want any of the books. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.